um, at the end of your internship program, you are supposed to write the board exam. Am I right? You've heard of that. What's the board exam about, do you think? Ethics, I am, I'm hearing ethics here. Hilda said something very important this morning. Did you hear what she said? It's not about competence. Yeah, it's, it's not about competence. It doesn't evaluate competence. In actual fact, the only thing that it does is it evaluates your theoretical understanding of ethical problems and how to manage it. That's the, the long and the short of it. In actual fact, to touch on what, what Fred has mentioned, you can actually start your master's and you can complete the board exam by doing absolutely nothing but reading. And you can still pass and you can still go into practice. And it's going to be very, very, very non-beneficial to you. Okay, so let's, let's just break down those perceptions. Why is ethics important, you think? Okay, we're not harming others in our process, and that's one of the things that's covered. Yes. Okay, so it's about others but also about ourselves, am I right? The whole thing about ethics, if you think about it from the first sentence that Hilda indicated when she did a presentation this morning, was to protect others. It's a criminal offense to do X, Y, and Z if you're not registered, um, and, 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 and. So on the one end, it's about protecting the public. On the other end, it's also about protecting yourself. And the only way in which you're going to do that is if you understand the concept of ethics. So in your board exam, there's basically two components. There's a theoretical component. You know, what's the difference between an HR practitioner, a psychometrist, and a life coach? And then there's ethical problems and dilemmas. An ethical problem being what? A black and white, am I right? What must I have on my, my business card when I advertise myself as being a psychologist? Oh, I don't have my qualification on ethical problem, black and white, correct it. Ethical dilemma, well, we're doing psychometric assessments in large companies, but we're not giving feedback in those niche areas that we, that we spoken about earlier. So how do we manage that? We're doing mass tests, it's your responsibility to give feedback, but you're not, and you're just an intern, and your managing director said, well, that's not making us money. So how do we manage that? That's an ethical, ethical problem. So do you see the ethical dilemma? Do you see the difference between the two? And that's important because, again, psychologists and psychology, specifically within the South African context, is one of the most vindictive professions you can go into. Flashed with politics, flashed with, um, you know, et cetera, and et cetera. Why do I say that? Yilda, if you can just, just suck out of your thumb quickly. During the last 12 months, from... Practitioners, and I'm not talking about doctors and, and so on, psychological practitioners that have gone through disciplinary hearings was issues were submitted by whom? She says the public. If I go and draw the, the, um, the list of the people that, you know, you can go on the list and see all the people that have done stuff wrong on the HPCSA, right? You've seen that? Psychologists are giving up psychologists where in the medical profession, it's the patients that come and say, listen, my, my practitioner is not doing this. So on the one end, it's also to ensure that you understand what it is that you can do to be able to protect yourself in relation to the service in which you are also rendering. So there's this whole balance between these two domains that we constantly have to keep in the back of our minds. Now, I'm not going to give you a boring lecture on, you know, you have to go and study the Child Act and the Criminal Justice Act, and you have to go and understand the... Um, unethical business process models and et cetera of the HPCSA, but rather I'm going to present you with an ethical dilemma I experienced during the past 48 months. And I'm going to ask you to help me to manage that or to, to give me some insight because that is the type of situations that you will be getting in your board exam. And you need to be able to justify the reasons you have taken in relation to a certain action. Okay, so... I saw a clinical psychologist for personal development coaching, if you will. During this process, it came out that this clinical psychologist registered 
40, 43 years old, wanting to become better at it is that what she is, that what, become better at what she is doing and about herself and about the clients and so on. So, during the session it came out that she's gay, totally acceptable. However, she's acting as a man on various social media networks to be able to lure her clients to send her nude pictures of herself, of themselves. Okay. Ethical problem, ethical dilemma. So far. What's that? Huh? Okay, we're getting to the dilemma part, yes. But can you, in, a, in any personal or professional capacity, can you give yourself forth as being a man trying to lure a woman to send nude pictures of themselves to you? No? Okay, in any sense, that's not acceptable, for in, my, in my mind at least. Okay. Now it becomes a little bit more interesting. The people which she's engaging in, establishing these relationships, she is creating these um, fictional relationships where she is luring her clients. She's got a professional relationship with them. Right? So I'm seeing you as a patient. But now I'm transforming my personality into a man because I know you're desperate for a relationship. And I'm establishing an online relationship with you in the attempt to solicit nude pictures. Okay, so now, now it becomes a bit more difficult. Easy on the one end, it's wrong. Am I right? On the other hand, it's an ethical dilemma for me as the practitioner. Because now, how do I go about managing this? Because it's said with me in confidence, you know, you can only disclose, you know, in relation to three things or three times or three situations. When is that? For? Sorry? If it's criminal, if it's harm to others, that's being done, yes. Okay? Harm to yourself. If a court tells you to do it, and there's another one. Sorry? Ah, children are involved. Uh, they call them, what is that, what's that nice word? Um, vulnerable individuals. Okay. So, how do, how do we go about managing this? And you need to be able to argue to me whichever route it is that you are taking. Are you going to disclose? How are you going to manage that? And you need to be able to tell me why it is that you've chosen that route, because it's not black and white. Am I right? You can go both ways here. So, what do we do? Do we disclose? Because we've got all the information, we've got all the evidence. What do we do? Let's start. Is there harm to someone? Yeah. Who is that someone? Some, the clients. Yes, that's the one. On the other hand, if this continues in the way in which it's going, they're also damaging the profession. Am I right? So there's two things that's an issue here. We've got the profession and we've got actual people. Okay, now, harm is being done. So I can, I'm quickly going to phone the HPCSA, submit the report and say, listen, incapacity, disciplinary hearing, evidence, there we go. Am I right? Straightforward. Straightforward, isn't it? Why isn't it straightforward? You guys must help me here because this is an ethical dilemma. This is what you are going to have to dissect in your board exam. You're going to have to tell how you're going to approach this situation, this ethical dilemma. What do we do? Okay, Okay, so that's, that's a good thing. Trying to have a first a discussion with her to say, okay, listen, do you understand what's going on? Do you understand the reasons? And good thing she's a psychologist, so she understands, and that's probably the reason why she also came, and not going to another clinical professional because of the politics and the whatever the case might be. Okay, so that's a, that's a nice approach to take. Ethically, what do we need to do now? Because we need to protect the people that are currently going through this process. And we need to make a decision whether or not we're going to disclose to them, because there's harm, those three or four things that we've spoken about. There is harm there. And we need to justify the reason of disclosing versus not disclosing. 
go. If we can make it as easy and straightforward as that. So, we have a good discussion with her. But now, she decides, she says, okay, I'll talk to them and it's fine, but I'm not going for another session. Uh, we are done and etc. whatever the case might be. My professional relationship with her ends. What now? Do I still have an obligation? Yes. Okay. Maybe she's crazy. I don't know. But all the evidence is there. Social media profiles, nude photographs, emails. So you've got all of the evidence you, as a practitioner, have all the evidence available with you. Good. Make sure, cover all your bases, your bases, because there's nothing worse choosing whichever route it is that you are going in and you haven't covered yourself in that process. Then you become the victim and you become the person that needs to go justify why it is that you've disclosed to one of her patients X, Y, and Z. Go. Yes. There we go. There's another point. Now I've got a... Oh, sorry. Now I've had a discussion with her, but I've got an idea in my mind what to do. Ethical guidelines say, we need to go and speak to another professional. We need to go and clarify what it is that we want to do and how it is that we're going to do it. Okay, so had a discussion with a very senior person at the Health Professions Council. Okay, indicated that there are two routes that you can take. Incapacity, submitting it through the board, or having a voluntary, voluntary deregister herself while she is going through a process of therapy or whatever the case might be. Okay, so nice approach. A little bit of an issue. We only know of maybe one or two of these clients or patients that she's gone through, that she's had these interactions with. We don't know about the 50, 60, 100 others. And it's not in our domain to even go or engage in a therapeutic relationship and whatever the case might be. But we are sitting with a problem. And the problem is harm is being done. So on the one end, again, we are protecting the person who is also our client. We have to protect, we've got a responsibility to the people around her. And we need to be able to justify the approach that we're taking. So we're taking the approach that we want her to deregister herself from the board for X period of time, voluntary, and having her then um, also confront these other individuals. Now what? Well, you obviously have to reassign to the individuals who were her clients who were seeing her in the capacity to other individuals so that they are still getting their ongoing therapy that they just had. Okay. There has to be some sort of follow-up that they are going to follow their treatment. Is that your responsibility as... like that. You stir the pot and you have to take responsibility. Project management, which you all have, right. Okay. So on the one end, now what we can do is we need to take responsibility for this individual doing X, Y, and Z, giving over clients, handing them over. But now, would it be nice for you if you've done something wrong, even if it's um, by yelling at a friend and saying, guys, I, I, I'm actually the person that made a mistake here. In something as simple and as sim as that, it's not easy, is it? By saying I'm the person that's in the wrong here. Now think about the current situation. What would the effects be if this client goes and reveals herself to say, "Listen, that guy that I'm actually in a therapeutic relationship with you with, trying to facilitate you to uh, to continue that relationship with that person because you need it, because it's good for your development. It's it's good for you in the in the career phase in which you are in." Oh, in the, the life phase in which you are in. I'm facilitating you to establish a stronger relation with me under the table so that I can satisfy my own needs. Now that person comes forth and says, this is what I've done. What now? You think that's an easy approach? You think that's, that will be good and valuable and fulfilling for both parties? Do you think that causes more harm, less harm? Do you see how, how interesting this becomes the more you think of it? And that's what an ethical dilemma is. It's about understanding that things in life aren't black and white. 
and justifying and quantifying the reasons why you have taken a specific route of action. Because you could say, this is my responsibility, and this is why, why I've stopped, and I can argue it from a legislative point of view, indicating that my scope of practice indicates that I have to do X, Y, and Z. And I can provide a, um, you know, a, a mechanism for this person to be able to, to do whatever they need to be, that needs to be done, but that's where my responsibility stops. I can argue on the other end the reason why I'm going to disclose to her, to the other clients, because there's, it's damage to the profession, it's uh, illegal because you're not allowed, if you look at the Criminal Procedures Act, which you also have to study, it says that you're not allowed to engage in criminal activities as a registered professional, am I right? And et cetera. So there's ways and means to argue the way going forward. Okay, last one, straightforward. Um, you're, a HIV, you're an HIV counselor, right? Or you're doing HIV counseling as part of your employee assistance program that you're with. As part of that, it comes forth that one of the people that you are seeing is HIV positive and she likes, and she likes sleeping around within this organization that you are working in. She knows she's HIV positive and she likes sleeping around. On the other end, you have another client that happens to, which she mentioned she slept with, and he comes to you in a totally different setting and say, hi, but um, I just wanted to also tell you that my wife is finally pregnant after 10 years that we have... Uh, that we have tried. Okay. He doesn't know that you know. There's not a lot of evidence because it's just hearsay. I am HIV positive. We don't have the physical documents in front of us. So now it becomes another situation of disclosing or not disclosing. The argument on the one end, we can say we are, we are not going to disclose because we don't have the evidence. X, Y, and Z. The other way we can go is that we are going to disclose because there's a vulnerable individual here. And who's the vulnerable individual? The unborn baby. The unborn baby. Yes. Six. When is, a, when is a child in terms of case law considered? Because you also have to study the Child Justice Act and so on. When is a child considered to be alive or baby or fetus? Six weeks. Six weeks he's considered alive. Okay? Which means he becomes a, or he or she is a physical person that needs to be protected. Now, if you choose the route and say, I am going to disclose, let's just forget about who we are going to be disclosing to for a minute. Let's say we are going to disclose um, in terms of this situation. How will we justify the reasons why we've disclosed? Okay. I like what you're saying about the how. This is the support mechanism which you're going to take in place. But... If you get submitted to the board for disciplinary action based on the fact that you've now disclosed this person's HIV status, how are you going to justify protecting yourself again? Because remember, who's the most important part in that relationship? Numero uno. Because without my registration, I can't, I can't practice. So how do we protect ourselves and how we justify it? Easy? Yes? Like that. We start the argument off by saying, point number one, the, the, the main thing, we can only disclose based on four reasons, and the one of them is when other people are in danger, right? So we've got that other people there. But now we can say we don't necessarily have enough evidence to be able to substantiate the, the reason which we've taken. However, there is a vulnerable adult or, or vulnerable individual here that cannot think for themselves that there is still an ability to be able to manage if there is actually, if she really is HIV positive, if she really did sleep around, with whatever the case might be. So it's about justifying your argument from a legislative perspective. So think of yourselves as little mini attorneys and go and read up on case law. Go and take that document that I've spoken about, about all of the um, submissions for ethical or for disciplinary action and go and see what are the main themes, primarily from within our scope specifically, it's about scope of practice issues. So it's not really to that effect, what I've spoken about, but the point is it's about working with outside your scope. So people doing long-term therapy, utilizing techniques that, not, but that they're not trained in, etc. Interesting enough, last year was one of the years where um, people giving forth qualifications that they don't have was one of the big spikes. So saying that you are qualified to do X, and you're not able to do X, okay? 
So go and take that as a, as a background and try and evaluate the reasons why people did that. Okay. Lastly, practically speaking, the board exam is structured in such a way to be able to evaluate the way in which you think, feel, and act, and how you would react in certain ethical situations. If you want to go and look at the, the themes, because there's a lot of case studies, go to the South African Journal of Psychology during the past 12 months and go and look at what are the primary aspects or the primary publications that was taken through and look at the titles. Don't even have to read the, the abstracts because that will give you an indication of the hot topics currently. Right? Go and look at the news. You know Google? Google? You know Google News? Go search psychology and contain it in the South African context to be able to see what are the hot topics. In the past, um, in the past 18 months, it's relating to um, certain religions that are using psychometric instruments to, or a certain church that uses a psychometric instrument to, um, uh, what do you call it, evaluate emotional regulation and whatever the case might be. That was an uh, example of a case study. It was in a previous board exam within the last 18 months. So go and look at the term psychology and go and to try and see what are the current hot topics and hot issues in place. Then also go and look at um, what are the presentations that people are, do are doing around ethics, specifically coming from the board. They've got roadshows, Hilda, you've got roadshows again this year. And go and look at the roadshows and the attend them and see what are the things they are, be they are hammering on in these roadshows, specifically from an ethics perspective, because I can almost guarantee you that stuff like that will be, in the, will be asked in your um, exam.